Today I want to talk to you about Kappa Mikey. This was one of my favorite shows growing up, about an American who moves to Japan and becomes an actor. It aired from 2006 to 08, primarily on Nicktoons Network, so it's hard for me to gauge how many people have seen the show, but I'm really excited to show you this interview I did with the creator of Kappa Mikey, Larry Schwartz. I asked him a whole range of questions, like if Kappa Mikey is actually named after the little Kappa creatures of Japanese folklore, to how did they end up getting the Japanese rock band V Crusaders to do their theme song especially right after they made a hit in the USA. Whether you've seen the show or not, this will really be a fun video. Larry has a really interesting background, and I think there's a lot that can be learned from this, whether you're a casual enjoyer of animation, or an aspiring showrunner. With the popularity of anime in the West nowadays, I've heard people often speculate that a show parodying both cartoon and anime like this would be really appreciated at the moment. Or even if this show came out a few years later in like 2010 instead of 2006. But I personally think it came out at a perfect time. Anime was still kind of just the thing on Toonami for a lot of people, and cartoons were just beginning to use anime art styles that really challenged the idea of what anime is, like Teen Titans and the Boondocks. Avatar The Last Airbender, arguably the most anime-inspired and influenced cartoon ever, came out in 2005 with great success, and I'm sure if you search it up online you can still find people arguing whether it's an anime or not at this very moment. Kappa Mikey created a bridge between cartoons and anime in the same show, while parodying both of them. And while one could argue the show doesn't have the most accurate portrayal of what living in Japan is like, or what living on Earth is like, I think that's kind of the point in a lot of ways. But honestly, the show could be about anything and I would still love it because the characters and jokes are just so funny to me. It's interesting to speculate how this show might have let people know anime is still a really big thing overseas and it's probably getting bigger, and that it's okay to like anime. Whoa, let's not go that far, hey. With that being said, let's jump into the interview. I'm gonna stop the video to add some points of content text every now and then, so if you don't really know about the show, you can still follow along. I'd really love your feedback afterwards of how do you like this presentation style, and if you'd like to see more artists on the channel sometime. So yeah, thank you Larry so much for taking the time to talk to me, and also, I need to point out there's a Kappa Mikey pillow facing the camera I didn't even notice on the call. Hey everyone, I'm Colby2D, and today it is my pleasure to introduce a very special guest. We have Larry Schwarz, the creator of Cap Mikey, along with some other Nicktoons such as 3 Delivery and uh, Speed Racer, The Next Generation. Uh, Larry, thanks so much for joining. It is a pleasure. Uh, Cap Mikey has always been one of my favorite shows especially, and uh, I'd love to know more about you. Uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself, how's your week been? Uh, it's been okay. Uh, I've been uh, working on, uh, uh, with my co-writer, Ivan Marie Palmer, uh, we are writing uh, book two in a uh, middle grade book that just came out uh, like two weeks ago called The Jewels Are in Prophecy. So now we're, we're writing book two, so it feels really good to kind of uh, be doing that right That's now. That's great that you're working on a follow-up for it. I actually uh, I actually have it right here, not to be a suck up oh, too much. Awesome. Um, Thank you. You know, it, it's a, I, I was reading, I was on a flight, so I actually was reading it more uh, digitally because I had a six hour flight and a big layover. Um, you know, it, it's pretty fun. I definitely see a lot of the, uh, the kind of classic writing coming through, a lot of kind of follow up dialogue, a lot of, you know, a lot of humorous little tidbits like, oh, he's grabbing the starburst. Oh, they're the red starburst, of course. You know, like it, it's very, classic but it also gives me a bit of a kind of judy bloom beverly cleary vibe with the writing of you know it's a, it's a really it's as entertaining of a book for a 27 year old reading a middle school book as as it could be so I, i'd say uh, that's that's awesome. really thank great great job <laughs> that's great thank yeah. you when i reached out initially i was really interested in how you got the beat crusaders to do the theme song for kappa mikey <laughs> You know, not only is Kappa Mikey one of my favorite shows, but Beat Crusaders is one of my favorite bands. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so it was a long time ago. So yeah. I'm going to, uh, if I'm, if, you know, people watch this and say that's not <laughs> how it happened, that's not whatever, maybe, I don't know. I'm going to give sure. you the best uh, to my recollections of what okay. happened. So um, when we, um, at my company then animation collective like when we would pitch our shows a lot of times we would um 
create trailers and things like that for them. And that's a lot of people do that now, but we were kind of like, uh, at that time, we were one of the few kind of independent animation studios that were doing that, that were like selling our stuff like that. And to do that, um, we would kind of find music that we thought was like cool and, 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 and use it. And when we first, uh, we're pitching Kappa Mikey like a long time ago when it was actually an older show and it was like mm -hmm. going to MTV. We had like heavy metal music and stuff in it. Mm -hmm. But I had really, I'd always kind of liked that kind of like punk sound. And we actually, um, mm -hmm. after Kappa Mikey had gone on to do that uh, in a lot of our shows, like both in our in our pitch materials that we would use, we'd often use like punk, um, like like me first and the Gimme Gimmies would always, we'd, a lot of times we would use them just for like our internal pitches. Like they mm -hmm. would do like, you know, punk covers of like, you know, famous songs. Mm -hmm. But then like for our show Three Delivery, like we had a punk song and we even did a like a, like a, a punk remake of um, uh, Speed Racer for Speed Racer, The Next Generation. So, um, but the way we found the Beat Crusaders is Arisa Kono, who was uh, one of our producers uh, in-house, uh, had um, the the CD from there, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess hit, uh, hit in the in the USA uh, yeah. was uh, I had just heard that song, and I was like, oh, that's like a cool song, like that kind of like it's kind of like the opposite of like Captain Mikey, you know, like hit in, we were thinking like, oh, hit in Japan. Hey, stopping in to give some quick context. Hit in the USA is an opening song by the band Beat Crusaders for the anime Beck Mongolian Chop Squad. It's an amazing opening in both the song and the visuals and an opening rock song sung in English about being a hit in America was really cool and innovative. So taking this huge song hit in the USA and trying to flip it around in the hit in Japan is a really cool concept. All right, that's all. And uh, I think the opening, sequence was the last thing you know that we did and um we we were talking with Reese and we you know they were uh, Beat Crusaders were represented by Sony Music Japan and we were yes. like well, why don't we reach out to them and see if they would be willing to I, I guess we thought originally maybe like do some kind of like a take on hit in the USA like an opposite mm -hmm. of it you know for us and um you know, we I get we negotiated with Sony Music Japan, and then we they, we got them to agree to the Beat Crusaders to agree to do it, which was amazing. And then, you know, I know we sent them, I guess, materials. I, I don't know if we had completed episodes yet, but I know that we had, you know, definitely we had pieces of it, and we had scripts, and we had Bibles and packs and stuff like that. And Arisa, because she spoke Japanese, really kind of was the go between between us and them. And we we sent it. I remember when we got the um the the song back yep. uh it was like amazing it was like that was it mm -hmm. it was like you know i think in you know everyone in my company used to make fun of me and say like if it's not my idea that i didn't like it but that i i loved it it was like mm -hmm. terrific mm -hmm. you know from the get-go and um i think maybe you know we changed we asked for like one change i think was like i think it was originally something like um um I don't know if this was like in the final thing and this is what we changed, but I think it was like hadn't got a clue or something like that. And we thought maybe, I think Nickelodeon thought that was like a little bit too like depressing or something. Uh -huh, <laughs> uh -huh. We changed it to like looking for something new or something like that. Some, it was something like that. We asked for like one change. They did it and it was like, and terrific. And that's, that's how we got it. And we were so lucky to have it. We had gone like, Maybe bef after the first season of Kappa Mikey, we had gone on a trip to Japan with the writers. Like we took mm -hmm. like the writer's room and um, we actually went to uh, uh, Nagoya to go see the Bee Crusaders like perform. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that they didn't sing the song. Right, uh, right. You know, we wanted, to, and they definitely didn't sing like a version of it. Like, hey, hey, look, look. So I don't right. think that, that, I think it came, I think it came afterwards, but it was still mm -hmm. really awesome to go see them. And um, we actually made, especially for them, um, we brought like these gifts. We went to Tiffany's and we got that. Tiffany had these like keychains with the, mm -hmm. like, like they were like silver keychains and they had like a little like silver circle on them. And we had the Kappa Mikey like logo engraved on them. And like, we made a lot of like cool swag and stuff for Kappa Mikey. Some of it I still have. Yeah. I wish still, I wish I had one of those uh, Kappa Mikey keychains because those are really cool. That's probably like the rarest of like the Kappa Mikey yeah. swag. 
Yeah. Calvin might keep Tiffany key chance, but right. That's that's really cool. And I mean, I probably will preface in the video before uh, we jump into this uh, video, but you know, to just quickly summarize the premise of Kappa Mikey, it's about an actor from America who moves to Japan and is the star of a show in Japan. And, uh, you know, it's a very wacky show and it comes with the kind of culture shock and comedy of that. Um, we also see the kind of the culture shock in, I think, you know, in your book that we've mentioned, The Jewels of Verne Prophecy of a Boy Moving from Connecticut to Paris, uh, I was wondering if you had a big inspiration for either Japan specifically or just in general of stories of someone moving to another country, you know, whether there's a language and culture barrier, if this is something that's really special to you or if it's just more coincidence and I'm looking too far into it. No, I think it's cool that you're looking into it. I mean, I think <laughs> kind of like, you know, fish out of water thing or uh -huh. kind of like someone moving from, you know, one thing to like another is mm -hmm. like, you know, kind of like an archetypal story that kind of like resonates with that age group. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of these two particular things, um, you know, both of them, I, I've been lucky, you know, for work that I've been able to travel a lot. We would go to Japan a lot. I would go to Europe a lot. I've loved Paris. I think both of these things both came out of like, you know, really like my like love of that of those places and like mm -hmm. inspiration and being inspired by things there, uh, both in you know in Japan and 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 then for the Jules Verne prophecy like in Paris. Mm -hmm. Um, Kappa Mikey, like the, I, I got the idea for Kappa Mikey because, uh, you, uh, I thought that, you know, there was a whole, at that time, like a real talk about like, you know, like kind of like anime shows and stuff first starting to like come to like America and things like that. And right. at the same time, there were like these kinds of like, you know, shows on Cartoon Network that had that kind of like pop graphic, like, mm -hmm know uh thick line american style and i just thought it'd be cool like oh what happens if we had a show that combined both so we took like you know mikey which was drawn in that kind of like pop graphic style and we put it into uh into like an anime uh show um for the jules verne prophecy you know i i also while working like to play hooky and i love buying a lot of like junk uh mm -hmm. and i love old bookstores and things like that and mm -hmm. i had just seen like a set of like jewels these like uh red uh bound like bound with like gold lettering and like really cool like jules verne books in a in a french bookstore right. and just so many of them like in this like volume in this like set and i thought oh wow what would be, what would be cool if like someone found one that um you know wasn't one of the books that jules verne mm -hmm. wrote and that's what that's what the story is that owen finds like a jules verne book that's not a jules verne book that anyone knows about and it's actually you know a treasure map that he and his friends rose and naz uh follow to find a, a really cool treasure in the end definitely and um not to segue too far but i but i've i've always had the question or i've always seen speculation or theory are you at liberty to tell um the origin of the title of kappa mikey or why it's called yeah, kappa sure. mikey well it's a good segue because you know we said fish out of water so yeah, kappa, yeah are these, you know, mythical creatures that, you know, are, are water creatures, but that had come out of the water and to eat cucumbers, but also unfortunately to like a lot of times drown children, but we, we kind of like left that part <laughs> out. But uh, so there, you know, we said, oh, they're like a fish out of water. And obviously like, uh, you know, a, a, a kapamaki roll is like a, is a cucumber roll, you know, because of that. And his name was, was Mikey. So we thought it was, it would be like, uh, a cool, it's catchy a cool yeah vibe. that makes sense yeah i remember as a kid uh you know I, I remember like looking up like what is a kappa like like what is that and then i would see you know it's a japanese folklore creature and you know sometimes it does funny pranks sometimes it drowns kids and i was like <laughs> maybe i have this wrong maybe it's something else but no i definitely see that that fish out of water um analogy and that's a really funny um you know, it definitely shows in the show. I mean, there's definitely a lot of uh, culture shock. And it's one thing I will say, you know, how you mentioned uh, networks at the time were really having popular shows. They either had that very pop graphic show like 
Craig McCracken and Gendy Tarkovsky's shows, like Powerpuff Girls, Samurai oh. Jack. They were very graphic, very flat. Um, but you know, then there was anime blocks on networks and they were getting very popular too. Uh, especially very early 2000s, late 90s, uh, you know, just kind of early internet culture and how like Japanese videos and shows would just kind of make their ways through randomly either on networks or just on the internet. I'm sure it was probably a really interesting time for you, especially with uh, how well versed you are and were in Flash at that time. Uh, and your other ventures, as I've kind of researched about in my my spare time, like uh, with your toy company and whatnot, I'm sure there was a lot of research in Japan and, you know, the toy industries and mascots and plushes in Japan. So would it would, would I say would it be correct to say that those like influence the show at all too? like for your other business ventures before working in animation? Did you have a lot of connection to japan and asia definitely i mean definitely like i you know when i had uh the toy company you know i also got to go to japan uh, uh a lot and a lot of our the some of our toys you know were very much like we had these toys called the science freaks and if you look at the design for that and everything like that um there was uh, really kind of like influenced by that aesthetic mm -hmm. and a lot of our packaging also like you know i would like buy um different kinds of like not not like toy packaging but like like food packaging and things like that that i would see in japan and we would bring that back and we would use that mm -hmm. as inspiration like for our packaging and stuff for like our boxes and like the other kinds of things the toys came and you know and also like you know flash was just happening then and that right. was kind of like a real life changer because while we were um you know creating those toys we were also able to you know create like animated and and also live action like content around it that we mm -hmm. broadcast ourselves you know like very early on like you know bef uh, you know when it was just starting out and we never would have able we never would have been able to do that before that technology came out so it was like right that was kind of like i mean flash you know is such a life changer thing and you for used flash for the website as well right for the for the web design you know yeah, as, as adobe yeah. intended before yeah people yeah, start using I, it for animation yeah 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 i mean we used it for the i don't I, I think that you know we were using it simultaneously like mm -hmm. you know with the um we didn't say oh we're we're using this for our web design you mm -hmm. know we'll use our flesh we were we were like oh we're you know doing these um uh you know shorts and things like that and our web pages we can do so much more cool stuff with it and they can also load so much faster mm -hmm. uh and everything like that if we were doing it in flash so that's why you know we did it all like that yeah and, and by the time i started using flash um adobe had said fine we'll make our own kind of web web technology now since everyone's just going to use it for animation anyways um but you know that was years before they rebranded from flash to animate but you know that's really interesting to hear and it's really cool to see that it kind of has that multifunctional purpose for not only just your web design but also for the animation i i was just thinking of some questions that people might be interested in um i, I wanted to ask you uh did you have a favorite episode of kappa mikey and or a least favorite episode. I wouldn't pressure on a least favorite, but if you have a favorite, I'd love to know. I, I definitely think my favorites are um, the, um, I love, you know, it's a two part, the karaoke episode, which was mm -hmm. like, the last episode of the second season. They were, mm -hmm. final, they were final, I like, love that. And um, I also love the, the last episode of, I think it was the last episode of the first season was like the Christmas special, yeah, uh, yeah. Which, which I love. So those are my favorites. In terms of my least favorite, you know, I think that I, I, I really do, I and mean, it sounds stupid, but it's like, I really do like love them all. And I love mm -hmm. things about all of them. And I think that if I didn't, anything that I didn't like, we wouldn't mm -hmm. have let through anyway. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we had, I was very lucky to be able to work with like, you know, I'm not an animator. So it's mm -hmm. like, I was able to work with like an incredible team of animators mm -hmm. uh, at, at, our, at my company and an incredible team of writers, you know, also that have gone on to, uh, to really good, you know, cool, like writing stuff. Like, um, you know, so, um, 
I, you know, I, I, I think they're all great. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's great to hear. Um, but do, yeah, what, the, do you have a favorite? Uh, capital I, I would say, you know, I always think about it. And I think, you know, there might be episodes that are a little funnier or a little more action paced. But my in my heart of hearts, I always say uh, the episode where they lose the scrapbook and they're taking all the photos again for the scrap where Mikey's taking the photos of Mitsuki for the scrapbook. And that that's always my favorite episode, I think. So I really want to make a quick detour to talk about my favorite episode because I do an awful job presenting it here. So my favorite Kappa Mikey episode is one where Mikey learns about how important recycling is in Japan and how there's plenty of recycling categories for different objects. While this is educational in a sense, Mikey gets so obsessed with recycling, he starts throwing everyone's stuff out. He recycles Mitsuki's scrapbook with all her important and embarrassing pictures, and Mikey tries to recreate these moments with Mitsuki without her knowing her prized photos were lost. There's also a B-plot of Ozu, the manager of Lily Moo, setting up Lily and Gonard as a couple to attract the attention of the media. And it's just a really funny episode that flows really well and has its fair share of comedy, friendship, and heartwarming moments. Just kidding, screw all of that. We need to talk about the recycling song that's been stuck in my head for 15 years and will never leave my head. Mikey, don't you look so sad? I really do mean it with no exaggeration when I say the recycling song has been stuck in my head for 15 years. So yeah, let, let's just get back to the interview. Speaking of the Christmas episode, I actually uh, uh, didn't see the Christmas episode as a kid. And it was just randomly talking to one of my roommates, Jonah, in college, who was like, tell me about the Christmas episode. And it's just randomly. I don't remember what we were talking about when he was like, you know, Guano was like, not like a purple rat right and i'm like i was like no way and he's like you didn't see the christmas episode I, i'd say like that changed my whole world view that 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 changed the trajectory of my whole day son daddy son Am I the last person to ever find this out? Like, genuine question, am I stupid for assuming Guano is just a magical purple Pikachu in this world? There's there's moments people talk about as like, oh, they, they freaked out when they saw an animation. Like, oh, and Family Guy, Brian Griffin died. And they're like, what? Brian's dead? Yeah. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Brian's dead. But for me, it was uh, Guano and the Christmas special. So uh, yeah, I would definitely say a tie up there for me. It's definitely evoked the biggest uh, reaction from me or I just wasn't paying attention enough as a kid. And I'd, I'd have to say Mitsuki is my favorite character. She's just relatable, you know, just kind of nervous, kind of sweet, like kind of badass. I mean, I'm not badass, but I loved, you know, all the characters, but, and you know, part of my research, I never knew the uh, Dancing Sushi had their own uh, little show. Um, my sister would always tell, my sister has always messaged me just out of the blue, remember the Dancing Sushi from Kava Mikey? And I'd be like, yeah, I, I remember them. She's like, yeah, they, they were so like, they were like hypnotic. Like you'd just be watching the show and the Dancing Sushi would come on and you'd forget where you are. It was really funny to see that they had their own show. I don't know if I just missed it or if it wasn't in the United well, States. It was a, no, uh, well, Nicktoons bought like a bunch of um, shorts. I don't remember how many we did. I think mm -hmm. like maybe like 26, like, you know, short form things like that they ran as interstitials. Mm -hmm. um, a while ago, um, I had done a reboot of, a da of, of Dancing Sushi to do it as a as a longer format uh mm -hmm. show i've always really loved those characters i had some like really cool like ideas from it but we we couldn't get traction <laughs> like on it um but you know i i definitely think that you know in the cap and mikey universe there's there's there there are definitely more stories uh to explore and mm -hmm. there's certainly more you know dancing sushi would be would be great uh, yeah i do remember them showing up in the uh the wizard of oz parody as a little more uh they, you know, they have lines in that episode, even though they act more as uh, munchkins in the, the Wizard of Oz parody uh, parallel. But uh, no, that's uh, really interesting to hear and just talking about more stories, I guess, with Kappa Mikey. Um, you know, as, as much as I love it, as much as it's my favorite show, 
I, I, I don't, I don't know if I ever had that burning feeling like we need more of the, we need more of the continuation of the plot. Um, do you think if you had more, would you have, uh, would you explore further plot elements? Like, would there be, would they be older? Would they have more of a romantic element? Is there something that you were looking to explore further if there is more, Kevin Mikey? Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, and I feel like terrible now just like leaving this out when I said how lucky we are to work with like great animators and great writers mm -hmm. and things like that. But I think, you know, one of the, the key things that really like made that show were like the voice actors, you know, Absolutely. And it, like, we were the, like those characters just so came alive because of them, you know, we were so lucky and, you know, uh, like a lot of I mean, I've heard comparisons that I'm not like bragging and it's it's not mm -hmm. the same thing, you know, but it, it's nice to hear anyway that, you know, people are like, oh, it was like the Seinfeld of animated shows because of those kind of characters. And I think that, you know, I would love to, that's why, you know, for me, like kind of like watching the um, karaoke episodes, you know, mm -hmm. is so nostalgic because I just like, I, I, to me, I feel those are kind of like real characters and I would love to keep telling stories with those real characters. You know, I don't know if, um, you know, it was, it was interesting then because, you know, we, we really had, this was before streaming and everything and every mm -hmm. single thing had to, every episode had to have like a beginning, middle and end. You really couldn't have like, you know, real character development or real storyline development over different uh, episodes because everything had to be, you know, people, things would be rerun, things would be played out of order and stuff like that. Definitely. And I think, you know, a nice thing to have, be able to do in like the streaming world um, would be to, um, uh, you know, be able to tell kind of like longer stories with them and like develop like those characters, you know, over mm -hmm. the course of, you know, a longer kind of thing, which is what I actually like about like, you know, in, in books also that that we're able to do that. And like, you know, with, with like the Jules Verne prophecy, like, you know, we did mm -hmm. the first book and it does, it has an ending, but it has a cliffhanger. Right. And you know, hopefully you want to read the next one, but the characters develop over it and the story continues and hopefully, you know, there'll be more. And, and I love, uh, you know, the opportunity to be able to do that. Right, and yeah, I think we see that a lot nowadays with shows on, whether they be streaming or on TV, it seems like a lot of shows are getting a first season just kind of to test the waters, whether it be more comedic or whether it be more, I guess, quote unquote, filler. They kind of do their own thing for a season and then season two starts and uh, big bad guys come in and now there's a big overarching plot. And it seems like it kind of, and I've read some articles from creators that say, you know, we needed a season so that we could have reboot replays happening on TV, but now we're going to have an overarching plot. And so, you know, if someone doesn't see last week's episode, they can still randomly watch a, a filler episode, you know, quote unquote. Um, and uh, I, I've seen a lot of people say like season two is where they begin to do that. Um, so well, we had a, you know, we did a live action series for also for Nicktoons called Alien Dawn, and you know that was that was really difficult for us because we really wanted to tell like a story that went through the you know that 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 unfolded over the course of the thing, and but we also so we kind of did a hybrid because each thing did have a beginning, middle, and end, but mm -hmm. then we tried to do like little bits. But now if that were like a streaming thing, we would have really been able to do you know more with that what you said about the overarching plot, it, it's about the, you know, how you mentioned the beginning, the middle, and the end of uh, of Kevin Mikey. Um, you know, I, I will say I do always really love just the overall just framework of the beginning of every episode starting with their work on stage and something goes wrong. It's slipping, but... <laughs> Donard, are you okay? I think I might have broken one of my livers. Uh, you only have one liver. How many do I need to live? One. And a lot of times I always would love when like, the end of the episode would play the same scene out, but they would do it successfully because, you know, there was something that went wrong at the beginning that they have to fix throughout the middle of the episode. And that leads them to do the scene properly at the end. Um, 
But when you mentioned, you know, the production of the show and needing to do it like a beginning, a middle and um, an end. Uh, and I don't know if this is accurate just from the research that I did, but if I understand correctly, um, I'd, I'd love to know more about, I guess, the production and the, you know, the business side of how you both pitched Kappa Mikey and if I understand correctly, you you still owned Kappa Mikey when, uh, when Nickelodeon and Nicktoons played it. You know, it wasn't that they took over and did everything, but because you had a studio that could do just about the majority of the work on the show, did that play a part in yeah, you so end there- owning it? Yeah, so there were there were, you know, kind of two ways to go about like stuff. And one was to, you know, as a kind of creator, you go in and you pitch it to like a network and let them develop it. And networks had that as part of their programming strategy. And then they also had part of their programming strategy for things that they didn't own, they would do acquisitions. And um, our we our business was that we wanted to be in that business where we would um, pitch these shows as pre-buys to the networks and we would put to get they would you know license it for broadcasts in the US and then we would go and we would sell it internationally to other markets and we would put together the financing we would and we would own it and that we wanted to do that because we we believed in like the value of like the intellectual property and stuff like that and you know it was it's um it gave us the opportunity then to be able to like get all these a lot of shows on, um, you know, which I don't know if we would have been able to now. I think now with the way that the the industry has changed, you know, both on the broadcast side and especially with the streaming side, that doesn't really like exist anymore. Like the streamers really, you know, and the networks, you know, really want to own the whole thing, Um, you know, and in order to really like kind of like get the money to finance it you really have to kind of like sell everything to like the you know as a u.s as a u.s producer like without you know subsidies and stuff like that you really have to sell everything uh uh you know to the streamer or 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 the network yeah well it was it seems like a very very interesting and and rare process but you know from from your past history that i've read you seem well very well versed in business so I think I would imagine that your business aspects definitely helped in terms of both obtaining the rights and probably pitching Kev Mikey as well. Well, um, we, 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 one of the things, you know, we, I, I mean, I don't know how much I know about business. I mean, it was very difficult as like an independent and as like, you know, mm-hmm. we were like a little guy and we didn't have kind of like the support of like a big, you know, parent company or like that. So, you know, we definitely failed a lot of times, you know, mm-hmm. and we, we tried and it was like, very very like seat of the pants to kind of like get it made but one of the things and you know what what i wanted like the advice that i give creative people is we always try to think about like our creative in terms of also like what the marketplace wanted you know so obviously you know expressing ourselves creatively creating great characters and telling great stories we definitely wanted to do that um but we also in order to get them made we had to think about like you know what what the market wanted so you know we were fortunate to be able to have like really good relationships with like broadcasters and with buyers and development executives and things like that that we really could kind of like anticipate what things would want and we would kind of you know put forward ideas that we had you know not necessarily be like oh everyone wants like this kind of a show so we kind of came up with that kind of show but you know we're lucky that we had a lot of ideas and stuff like that and we would know oh right now the market is look you know kind of looking you know for this kind of show so so that's that's the show that we would then you know pitch yeah and and as you mentioned earlier the you know seeing what people desired with the flat graphics kind of popping style and with the anime style and with just anime and culture in general yeah that definitely seems uh, like a really sensible uh, note for people to make uh, just in terms of, I guess, their own pitches and people that are looking to make their own stories uh, at the moment. Um, well, I mean, I think, you know, the opportunity of making your own stories at the moment is, you know, what's so exciting about it is really like, you know, it's great to get things on on a network and things like that, but yeah. to really have like, you know, I was saying how Flash kind of like changed my life and everything like that. We mm-hmm. were like, really like ahead of the time in right. terms of like those kind of like other kinds of platforms, you know, and, you know, was, but now, you know, if I had, you know, if I could, you know, do any of this myself, if I could draw mm-hmm. myself, if 
if I can animate myself, if I could edit myself, mm -hmm. you know, I would definitely be making my own stuff and like putting it on, uh, you know, whatever kind of like, whether it's YouTube or TikTok, mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. kind of platform, you know, to try to, to get it out there myself. I think that's, you know, that's like an incredible opportunity. And that's, you know, that's also a way not to just to, to build up a fan base and, you know, engagement with your characters and your stories, but also, you know, from a business standpoint, something takes off, then, you know, the, the streamers or the buyers, the broadcasters, they're going to be, you know, contacting you about it. Definitely. Definitely. That's, that's really great to hear. And that's, that's great advice. I mean, I, I was going to ask more if you kind of had any advice for people that wanted, that wanted to, you know, tell their stories that people that wanted to not only just work in the industry, but just tell stories in general, but that's all such great advice for that. And that's, that's really, I think helpful. And I think a lot of people will really, um, really appreciate hearing that, you know, in, including, including myself. Well, if you're, um, I mean, the kids industry also is going through a very difficult kind of time. Yes. Like that, you'll see, yes. like you know, you know, the future of all this is up in the air and things like that. Um, at least, especially this kind of, week, yeah. yeah. Everything works in cycles, but I think right. you know, right now we're definitely in a down cycle. And if you're if you're a creator of stuff, mm -hmm. I would a use your own platforms to try to do something because there's like an opportunity when like the bigger players are not putting stuff on then there's like an opportunity for people to go other places to find things and then also like if you're going to be if you are a creator and you're going to be trying to pitch things to like a streamer or a broadcaster i would say you know focus more on like prime time kind of like mm -hmm. animated stuff like older kind of stuff than you know than than kid stuff right now that's really interesting to hear that's that's very very insightful um Thank you for that, Larry. I appreciate that. Um, so I think that's just about all the questions that I had. I wanted to keep it relatively uh, brief. Um, I guess I have one last question. I guess I would say, uh, do you have a favorite Beat Crusaders song? I mean, I love our song. I mean, I, you know. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I guess, you know, like hit in the U you know, in the USA was like the first one. So it's sure. like I really liked it and I certainly, it, we had so much fun seeing them perform, you know, live. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but, but I mean, that was I, that was a really interesting time too because you know, Hit in the USA just came out, and then right like a month or two before Kappa Mikey came out, they did an opening for the show Bleach, which was a really really popular anime at that time. So that was a uh, really cool to see, and then Kappa Mikey comes out, and uh, well, actually, yeah. and I think the the, the lead singer of uh of the b crusaders played like our kappa mikey um the, his kappa mikey theme song that he wrote for us on yeah. a like, tokyo like on a drive like a morning radio drive you know commute mm -hmm. drive station and it the show was not on nickelodeon did a global acquisition for it but it wasn't on in japan but we would get a lot of requests from like different anime, like directors and creators and stuff in Japan. And we would be sending like DVDs and stuff to Japan for people to watch them, you know, because of that, because they had heard about it, um, you know, from the Beat Crusaders song. So it was great. So yeah, that's the interview with Larry Shores, the creator of Kappa Mikey. Larry, thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching. If y'all enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. I'd love to know what you think of this video and how I can make better videos for you in the future. If you have a favorite Kappa Mikey episode or character, I'd genuinely love to know your thoughts on the show. And I'll see you next week. All right, bye.